Welcome to NGA Notable Lectures, a podcast offering a deeper understanding of all things artistic. On the occasion of the 66th American Music Festival, Personal Visions at the National Gallery of Art, the festival's guest director, Roger Reynolds, spoke with young composer Michelle Liu about nurturing individual artistic pursuits and the role that academic training and mentorship have in the process. Traditionally, aspiring composers in the United States devote some period of time to formal study, but an educational program alone cannot prepare them for a professional life in music. In this conversation, presented on March 9, 2015, as part of the Works in Progress series, Reynolds and Liu highlight the challenges that young artists face in our times and discuss the part that personal mentors, as well as formal education, play in their support. Okay, so the music festival that is uh, one in a very long and remarkable list of events that have been held over six decades at the National Gallery of Art. It's an extraordinary and uh, extraordinarily valuable uh, tradition which we fervently hope will continue and uh, be treated with the kind of respect and resource allocation that it requires in order to make such things happen. Uh, I was having a conversation uh, with, uh, well, firstly, I had been talking with uh, uh, Stephen Eckert, the uh, past head of the uh, music section, uh, about the possibility of my doing what I have in fact done, be the guest curator for this festival. And shortly after that, I was uh, having lunch up in your uh, wonderful uh, restaurant above the uh, East Building uh, with Charlie Ritchie, who is a longtime friend and the associate curator of prints and drawings. He explained that he was preparing a uh, show uh, from the Canaan collection uh, of American prints and drawings, and uh, we got to talking about it in terms of the idea of personal visions, about the way in which he was selecting what would appear in that uh, show and uh, the criteria. Uh, and part of it turned on this issue of vision. Uh, I think we've, we've had a politician recently who has spoken about the vision thing. Uh, I'd hope that today with uh, Michelle we could talk a little bit about where visions come from and if you happen to have one, how you realize it, and if you don't have one, how you acquire it. So I'd start out by asking uh, you, Michelle, uh, how did you come to music? Well, how did it first enter your life so far as you can remember? Um, well, I grew up in the MTV generation, so I remember the first day that MTV was broadcasted, so I've, I've always been interested in music, um, but I wanted to be a rock musician, and um, somewhere along the way I was introduced to jazz, and through that I ended up at um, UC San Diego, and I didn't know that that school was such a great hub for contemporary music, and then I just, I was seduced by it, and uh, I don't know, that really, that was like a very quick answer, but... So serendipity played a role. But uh, maybe it's important to, um, at the very beginning here, point out that you're also a performer and that that uh, combination of ways of addressing creativity is very essential in your life. So Yeah, I mean, yeah, I have thought about this. Like, why is it that some people gravitate towards, um, you know, f like forms of expression that are more sort of, you know, like just completely, fully you know, specified, notated, like classical musicians, and, and then others are just really interested in just complete experimentation, and I feel like that might be something that you might just, it's hard to kind of find where that comes from, if it's nature or nurture. Right, but uh, about, about performance, you, when did you start playing the bass, and is that, did that precede composing? Yes, it did. Yeah, that's how I got to San Diego as a bass major. And what time, at what, it's, it's a kind of an interesting thing given the bulk of a contrabass yeah, that you would, you would have decided maybe tuba would have been another option. Oh, no. <laughs> I, started, I started on the guitar 
and then I realized that I didn't think the guitar was that great in, in the jazz idiom. And then I, I tried saxophone, and then I realized I would never become John Coltrane. <laughs> so then I picked up the bass in my 20s, actually. Oh, really? Hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> the process of finding how it was that you were going to fit into music was a pretty extended one. From so you so said I started guitar at age ten. Okay, so over ten years you migrated towards through your experience with jazz and rock and so on towards the bass. And of course, the that <clears throat> that arena includes a lot of flexibility. Let's say I mean uh, not to say that. Uh, improvisation is uh, in any way arbitrary, but uh, that it's all shape. But surely that must have had some relationship to the way you looked at music. Yeah, I mean, perhaps starting off as wanting to be in rock music, you write your own songs. And so, yeah, the idea of creation was always there. I wasn't, um, I didn't start off as a classical musician where you just, you know, you spend your whole life just playing other people's music. So as a performer, you mean? Yeah. Uh, so at what point, um, say, it, as as you began to play bass or out of the guitar experience and you were, um, what were these, were the pieces that you say, the songs, if, if songs is the right word, <laughs> were the songs that you were creating individual products or were they in some sense interactive with your surroundings and with others uh, how, how did that work in your case well at first I was just trying to write pop songs and I just think I just wasn't very good at it so then I would just get together with friends and jam mm-hmm. and, and have no plan of action and, and yeah and just kind of nurture that kind of creativity what about text, if you're writing a pop song? Yeah, I was never good at that, so <laughs> I tried. So it sounds like it's sort of a <clears throat> process of, uh, of adjustment and successive <laughs> approximation. Well, yeah, I sometimes I wonder maybe the reason why I got into new music is because it's, it's so abstract and that, that kind of appealed more to my senses rather than, I mean kind of exploring something that's that's kind of hard to articulate versus pop music where you're actually trying to say something pretty it's, specific. That wants to be extremely clearly articulated. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that will. Well, that's um, the, do you, I mean, the path that you're describing whereby you little by little uh, through actions and your response to the environment are like finding a place. Do you think that that's an experience that a lot of your peers also have ex- uh, had? I mean, we're, when I think we're speaking about the American experience as as the fundamental, and yeah. I have some things to say about that, of course. But yeah, but do you yeah. think that this this uh, kind of su- successive approximation approach is something that's fairly frequent? Or? I think it is. I mean, especially in the younger generation, a lot of um, younger composers are coming from a more varied background because it's not, we don't really have um, music in schools, like really great conservatory programs around all around the states. So we just start off with rock music and jamming in the garage and, and um, yeah. Garage or the basement or whatever. Yeah, that's that's certainly one of the things that that has to enter any discussion of uh, the evolution of of a young musician. In any case, is the fact that the uh, music training uh, in our primary and secondary schools is so woefully inadequate and so uneven. And depending upon the state or the city you're in, you may have some experience. But then on the other hand, you may have no experience whatsoever. And this creates a situation um, that is uh, extremely problematic because we find that young people, I mean, such as Michelle, not necessarily Michelle, arrive at a university 
And obviously they have the necessary qualifications or they wouldn't get into the university because uh, I think at least in the case of the University of California, you cannot even apply to the university unless you're in the top 8% of your high school uh, class uh, you know, peers. And even then, of course, that doesn't assure that you'll get in. It just means that you have at least the possibility to apply. So demographically, it's a very constrained group. And in general, I, my experience with them is that they're very lively, they're very bright, they're very full of uh, you know, energy and desire and so on. But if they're in the arts, it's also likely that they're very, very poorly trained or very, uh, what's the right word, uh, spotty. Yeah, I mean, that, that was what was so great about UC San Diego is you could come into the program and be a music major having basically never studied music before. No. And yeah. Well, yeah. that that may be nice from the standpoint of the student entering, but I assure you, it's, it's not problematic. It's yeah. not great because you know we we struggle all the time with issues of uh, remedial work and and so on. And uh, you know, did you, you you probably had to take even? I mean, I, I have to, to say, UCSD is very forgiving so long as there's a gift there. Right. The the focus is on the personal voice and not on the yeah, not on the, the presumed like musical skills that that a lot of institutions think that you need to have in order to move forward. Well that and, that's uh, uh so we'll we'll get we'll get to that place. But I wanted to also ask you uh in terms of this process of uh closure or focus, let's say that happened over the time between when you were 10 and when you were in your early 20s. Were there any particular individuals or events that were, in some sense, inspirational or motivational to you? Was it just a general process, or was it uh, personed or by individuals that were you know, interesting, nourishing, inspiring, whatever, either uh, you know that you actually interacted with or that you viewed from afar yeah from afar I mean for me it was a haphazard path until I got to um, San Diego I didn't have any mentors so I listened to like Miles Davis and the Beatles and those guys were my heroes mm -hmm. so so there wasn't any was there a particular person in your upbringing let's say that if not encouraging you, at least, uh, you know, permitted or nourished the idea of your becoming a musician. Nope. Yeah? Well, there we go. Yeah. yeah. I can certainly say the same thing is true. In, in, my, in my case, in my house as a child, there was no art, there was no music, there was no literature, there was... That just wasn't a part of the way the house operated. And, and you also had a very interesting path towards music. You were an engineer. Right? Well, I mean, right. what actually happened is that I, when I was 14, I was four years later than you, I had an experience uh, listening to a recording of Vladimir Horowitz playing the Chopin A-flat Polonaise. And it, I guess as the saying goes, it blew my mind. I simply had never experienced anything like that. I wore the record out, uh, I found all the records I could find by him, and soon my parents uh, began to uh, suggest that perhaps I should learn how to do this myself. I think they were suffering grievously from the uh, amount of racket coming out of the phonograph. And so I studied piano through high school and when I was graduating and going to go on to university, all the wise people I knew said, Don't do music it. doesn't make yeah. sense. Uh, uh, and of course, at that time, I was exclusively a, per a performer. And having, uh, with, the, with the piano, if you start as late at 14, it's, it's going to be extremely difficult to make that happen. So I said, okay, what's the next best thing? And for me, it was physics. I'd had a very good physics teacher. So I went through the engineering physics program at the University of Michigan, went out to California and got a job in the missile industry. And after a few months, I realized I was spending more time practicing the piano in a local Unitarian church than I was at my job. So I quit, and uh, much to the dismay of those around me, 
I went back and started over again uh, in, in music, thinking I'd be a small liberal arts piano teacher, maybe a accompanist, something like that. So this certainly, at least in this a very small sample, you see that the path towards becoming a musician of, let's say, some note in this society is not a straightforward one. So um, you mentioned Miles Davis and the Beatles and so on. Do and and I was uh, and and you said also that there were no particular individuals. Were there? Were there any particular uh, ones among these that were, let's say, more to your taste or that you resonated more with? I've, I certainly found in, in when I was developing that there was, I'll just use the word resonance, there were things happening between me and as a listener and certain work that would happen in some cases and not in others, even though I you know, would recognize it or appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's the really like the, the 70s era of Miles Davis, like the mm. really out there stuff. I just really like that and Jimi Hendrix and just, mm. yeah, people who are really pushing things. People who are pushing boundaries. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned in your program note, uh, I desire to stake out a place that is entirely my own. What's better about a place that's entirely your own or largely your own <laughs> or a place that you uh, feel you share with others uh, of like mind? Yeah, I guess when I wrote that, I was trying, it, you know, in, in that program note, it's I'm struggling with, with that. Like how much of your work um, should kind of show in order in order for for a listener to have um kind of like a, just a, a tiny foothold you need you you just can't be like parachuted in like scorched earth um just completely wild um like yeah you you still need to use the tools available to you like you know some of the idioms um in order to then kind of take that and go go somewhere else with it. So for me, it's like I do, I do want people to recognize, to be able to hear that I'm trying, that I'm having a dialogue with, the, with the, our past, our shared past in, in music, and, and that I'm trying to like, suggest new things. Mm -hmm. So that, that place that you spoke about, the, a place that's entirely your own, is, is a little relative in any case. This is uh, something I wanted to, uh, to bring up in the context of this uh, presentation, this discussion. <clears throat> I remember uh, when I was, let's say, sort of where you are uh, uh, in my own life, one of the crosses that we had to bear at that time, let's say young musicians in the 60s, was the, the requirement that we be not only original, not only have a personal voice, but be uniquely, astonishingly original. And I've, all, I've, I've had in the back of my head for a long time the, the thought that the German composer Karlheinz Stockhausen uh, might have been the source of that. So this morning I went to the net and, <clears throat> and looked it up, and I saw the following uh, uh, text from John Cage's Indeterminacies which I will read because I think it has some interesting uh, uh, characteristics. And I have to time myself because it, it needs to be done in exactly one minute out of respect for John. <laughs> We've now played the winter music quite a number of times. I haven't kept count. When we first played it, the silences seemed very long, and the sounds seemed really separated in space, not obstructing one another. In Stockholm, however, when we played it at the opera as an interlude, 
in the dance program given by Merce Cunningham and Carolyn Brown early one October, I noticed that it had become melodic. Christian Wolf prophesied this to me years ago. He said, we were walking along 17th Street talking, he said, no matter what we do, it ends up by being melodic. As far as I know, this happened to Webern years ago. Karlheinz Stockhausen once told me, we were in Copenhagen, I demand two things from a composer, invention and that he astonish me. That's a pretty high bar. So you mentioned earlier, Michelle, that you were perhaps drawn towards composition because of its abstractness. And can you talk a little bit about your relationship to the abstract or the problematic or the the unique in that in the sense that Stockhausen how do you relate to the idea that you uh, have to astonish someone? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I feel like um, we're lucky in that we get to work with time, and time is definitely something that you can utilize to to astonish, mm-hmm. because you can you can mold it, and so then with that, it's like with this container of time, like how how do you fill it? like the material with the form with the structure um so for me like what's really interesting is how you can build the different containers mm-hmm. for your material and hopefully then you know people will transcend their their chairs and just get lost in in the music transcend your chair and get lost in the music so perhaps it's time for us to ask if there are any uh, questions that the audience uh, members have that have been aroused by our conversation, or if there aren't any, we can just go on. But uh, we'd, we'd welcome questions. Yeah. A question from Michelle. Uh, uh, do you want to have a mic? Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm just. Otherwise, that you will repeat the question. Okay. The first right. Sorry. Sorry. A, a question for Michelle. You spelled out the phases that you have gone through from uh, rock music uh, to jazz to uh, currently performance and, uh, and composition, performance on the bass and composition. Do you sense within you the germ of anything else that might lead to yet another stage? Yes, actually. <laughs> I, I, to repeat the question. Okay, so he was asking me if there's yet another phase in my musical journey that might take me to another practice, I guess. Um, so lately I've been feeling kind of frustrated with instrumental music. So I'm, I'm hoping to start um, making more computer music. Um, possibly just abandoning the bass entirely and writing and writing for live performers. So if, so if you were to go towards computer music, what, in what sense would the computer aid you? Well, um, I, would be, I would love to make um, sound installations, like multiple spatialized speakers. I'm using Max MSP. Um, creating samples and just doing algorithmic processes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. You mentioned Stockhausen, <laughs> and then perhaps we can think of Darmstadt School and its influence on the American musical environment, specifically jazz, where people like Anthony Braxton, whose bassist Mark Dressel will be here next week, they take that improvisational context and mold it with new compositional theories to create what Lee Braxton would call his own language. To what extent does that influence you as well, improvisation and compositional theories in this context? Roger, do you want to restate that? And right. Then both of you respond to right. Um, so the, the basic question is the interaction between jazz traditions and the Darmstadt School 
and the way in which uh, there were, let's say, mutual appropriations back and forth that, the, uh, that certainly the Darmstadt School became aware of the vitality of uh, the jazz improvisatory activities in the States and uh, especially people like Anthony Braxton became more aware of the, let's say, structural approach that was common in Darmstadt. So Michelle's probably better did, equipped to address that. Actually, I'm kind of ignorant. Like, did Braxton go to Darmstadt, or did he ever actually have... He did. I mean, because it seems like it's only been recently that they've been encouraging a, a jazz kind of a jazz element to the festival, which is actually like this really late night thing that still feels kind of marginalized. Um, like it's like this, after all of their concerts are done, then they have the jazz improv stuff and it's like starts at midnight and everyone's too tired to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that may or may not be by design. Yeah. But uh, it's certainly the case that uh, the... As, as with uh, our personal courses that we've been discussing, the process of evolution at Darmstadt has also been uh, very, very mixed, very varied, very uh, redirected. And for those of you who, who don't know about the Darmstadt Festival uh, or a so-called summer course, which is a biennial thing, it occurs every other year, uh, it was started by the Darmstadt City Council after the Second World War, when they were intent on trying to understand, uh, in a certain sense, of what or who bore responsibility for that war. And there was a deep concern on the part of many European artists that somehow expression or emotional in extremity had had some part in the uh, behavior of uh, the German uh, nation and so on. So there was uh, a desire on the part of the Darmstadt City Council to address the question of what could we do to assure that that kind of thing didn't happen again. And their choice was to start an international music festival where young composers and performers from all over the world uh, come there every other summer. And uh, it has changed its nature continuously depending upon who it was that was directing it. And uh, Michelle was just telling me uh, before we uh, started this conversation that it seems to be changing again. Yep. What's happening now? Um, it just feels like now it's, it's um, they're, they're really opening it up to the students to direct the festival, to, to suggest what sorts of master classes and, and experimental concerts that they want to put on. And, um, and it seems like the concern now, in, uh, largely amongst the younger German composers, is conceptual art, like conceptual music, um, stuff with multimedia. And so the kind of like the model of the, the, the composer that sits, in the, you know, sits for hours behind the desk, and yeah. <laughs> it's, it's changing. It's more collaborative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this... This is uh, one of the earlier phases of Darmstadt uh, in terms of the conceptualism that the young German musicians seem wedded to. Often turned out to seem, it seemed to be the case that the piece was an excuse for writing the program note. And in fact, the program note was uh, frequently something uh, in the nature of a manifesto with lots of uh, uh, gnarly philosophical, quasi-philosophical uh, uh, machinations. Uh, that was <laughs> very perplexing. But uh, the good thing about Darmstadt is that it has remained a magnet and that it has continued to evolve. So probably its audience also evolves, or it evolves with its audience. Mm -hmm. Just because we have already spent uh, a session talking about background, as it were, we're ready to launch into uh, deeper waters, but I thought it would only be fair to you to just say a few quick words about how I came to be here, and then Michelle can very briefly say how she came to be here. Uh, as it turns out, both of us seem to have uh, taken a kind of circuitous route. 
uh, I became aware of music as a really important uh, prospect only at the age of 14. And I studied piano during high school. When it came time to go to the university, I was advised by all those wise people that one uh, perhaps unfortunately listens to at that stage of life, that music was not uh, the proper or more promising route. So I studied engineering physics at the University of Michigan. Uh, found out that indeed that wasn't what I ought to have studied and went back and started over again in music. Uh, first as a performer and then gradually realizing that composing was something that uh, captivated me. So. Yeah, and I, and I sort of moved in a, in a kind of backwards route. I started off um, just wanting to be a rock musician and I didn't have any really, any kind of formal musical training. And once I... Um, entered UCSD, I then kind of started trying to gain all those skills, and um, and I feel like I'm always struggling with that kind of feeling of inadequacy. But um, yeah, it's it's I, sometimes I wonder. Um, I had no one really advising me for my path in 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 my studies, and. Um, and if I were to advise a young student now, I honestly don't know if I would encourage them to go into composition because of... Well, it's the, a, yeah, it's, it's definitely not a, a straightforward uh, and uh, inviting road. It's a difficult situation. Uh, and I think that in general... I got, I got in great difficulty with my colleagues at uh, the University of California, San Diego. We occasionally have what we call a retreat where we go and, and try to talk about things in a more general way than we do in the normal course of uh, time. And I propose that we should abolish the music major and that we should only teach service courses to the scientists and uh, social scientists and so on, that we should devote ourselves to stimulating the undergraduates to care about music rather than pretending that music uh, as a profession was a very promising one. And naturally, I, was, I wasn't quite strung up, but it was close you, to that. You, you seriously proposed yeah, that? Yeah, no, I seriously yeah. said that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I but mean, so then, uh, as, as part of this faculty of this large music... Um, school, like how do you then prepare the students to get out into the real world? Like how much of that do you feel is your responsibility? Uh, of, of which? Um, of sort of like, on the one hand, nurturing a student's musical vision, but also preparing them with the business side of things, perhaps, or the... Yeah, this is... Uh maybe it's not what one would expect uh, we would be talking about, yeah. but it's an extremely important matter. And the, the way I see it, Michelle, is that in, in the context of, of UCSD and of other programs that I've uh, been involved with, there's a sense that the students uh, don't want to descend to the level of pragmatics in that regard. Yeah, they won't. They won't it's listen sort of to you. unclean to talk about yeah. how will I make a living. Because I know at the time when I was a student at San Diego, if you tried to tell me that I need to work on my business skills, I would just, I would just say, yeah, yeah, I don't need to. Yeah, we're you know sort of up there somewhere, and and uh, it it has not been infrequent that a student in in our program who has not been studying with me and is graduating will make an appointment and will want to understand how their music is going to get played now that they're leaving the university. The bubble, yeah. And so my first question to them in that context is always very disconcerting for them, which is, what do you have to offer somebody else? If you want them to play your music, what are you going to do for them? And that idea of reciprocation, let's say, at least, uh, is alarming to them. It, it rubs against this kind of idealistic, yeah. kind of artist vision. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, to, let's, uh, let's go back up slightly to the question of uh, 
let's say that w- you have gotten, uh, as was the case in your, uh, in your life, to your early 20s and you realize that you want to study music or you want to find in music the things that you, that you need to know. And you found yourself uh, at a university without any particular reason to have chosen it, because that's where you were. And so, uh, at, how do you feel that, uh, as as you as your educational process went forward, was what was the path of deciding what you needed to know? I mean, was it okay? that you just took the courses that were offered? Or at a certain point, do you begin to wonder, well, why, is, why am I studying this rather than that, and so on? I mean, how do you find your way towards the things that you believe you need to know, you need to have? As a yeah, I mean, the more you learn, the more you realize there's more that you have to learn. and. Initially, I just thought I would just take all the courses that were required of me, and I realized that that wasn't really kind of helping me with kind of my own personal path, like piano skills or, you know, being able to analyze a Mozart string quartet or something. I wasn't sure how that would really apply to me personally in in my music. Um, And I know it's like, how do you evaluate a student? If they're a music major, it's like they they should be able to do these things. Um, but the great thing about San Diego is that it was more focused on allowing each um, student to just really do what they wanted to do. And um, and so then I realized that I should just kind of make my weird music <laughs> and not worry about um, the fact that I sometimes I can't hear a chord you know chord progression that well or something. Well, yeah, the, but then you went on to Stanford. I went on to Stanford. What was the climate like there? They're, they're still very conservative. You know, they, they made me take all these tests, these, these really scary tests where they time you, they give you, um, I think they give you 10 pieces throughout, you know, 500 years of music history, and you have to analyze them and say, and, and they're anonymous. They, they, they rub out the name of the piece and the composer. And you have to say who you think it is and why, for what period of time, and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And they force you to take courses on um, Renaissance music and just be able to talk about it. And in a way, it was, I was kind of glad. <laughs> but I can't remember any of it now that I'm not doing it. Um, uh, okay, so let the, before we get to the question of individual instruction, it happens just by chance that uh, the uh, that Stanford University has uh, a number of faculty members who came out of the University of California, San Diego. San Diego has been a kind of experimental leader uh, internationally for many decades now. Uh, for what reasons, you know, we don't need to try to figure that out. But uh, a couple of years ago, one of our former graduates, I don't know whether you studied with Mark Applebaum at any point. A little bit. Okay, well, we can go there if you wish. But uh, Mark uh, had gotten a position at Stanford, and I think that uh, he's he's an extremely dedicated teacher, very much interested in pedagogy, and so at a certain moment, uh, I had a call from him one Saturday, and he said, I'm thinking about organizing a seminar on pedagogy. And I said, oh, this is uh, that's definitely not the kind of thing I would uh, embrace easily. So we had a, a little kind of personal negotiation. And I said, well, I'm certainly interested in the idea of mentoring. If we can say mentoring rather than pedagogy, then I'll be more inclined to be interested in that. And uh, since he wanted to be able to bat things around and so on, we came to an agreement. Uh, and uh, so uh, a year a year or so later, there was in fact a three-day event at Stanford in which there were, I think, eight uh, composers from different parts of the country 
of uh, different persuasions, uh, a couple of women, you know, it was a diverse, sort of diverse group, a little bit too, uh, I mean, not as diverse in the ways I would have liked it, but as is often the, in the case, uh, what is often the case in these situations, it depends upon the funding source. So in this case, the funding source was the Stanford uh, public relations people, and they thought that certain institutions were worthy, and others such as, let's say, Oberlin, a small liberal arts college in Ohio, which has certainly the best preparation for a young composer in the country, that wasn't at Stanford's uh, level, so they weren't included. In any case, uh, as this uh, conference unfolded, there, there, it became very clear that there were two, uh, I don't know what to call them, I call them camps, I guess. And the one camp was the one that you, uh, let's say, sort of referred to in your comment about the Stanford testing. That was the idea of what is called modeled-based teaching, where a young composer comes into a program and is asked to begin her studies by showing that she can write uh, an exposition in the style of Mozart or a, uh, you know, an intermezzo in the style of Brahms or something of that sort. So the idea there, as I understand it, is that you, you gain some kind of technical capacity and then little by little you individuate. You become more and more yourself out of this knowledge of and commitment to tradition. The other uh, pathway or camp uh, is, is a very, I mean, the way you said it, Michelle, is, uh, <coughs> uh, isn't exactly the way I would say it, but the, the idea is that, that we try to look at each composer who comes in and we try to say, what is it that that person is trying to do? And whatever it is that they're trying to do, we try to help them do it better. So there's no method, no skill, no commonality uh, built into that process. And its outcome is that, let's say, if everything is customized to the student, presumably they get more and more expert at doing the thing which they're highly motivated to do because it's their direction that's driving things. So that you seem, it seems like you've sort of t uh, tasted both flavors. Yeah, I mean, in, in a way I'm, I'm appreciative of having, of having been forced to go in and, and you know, refresh my skills. And, and in a way, I guess it's like a kind of responsibility of the institution, just in case you want to go on and teach, that there are these things that you can teach. Um, but I know that things are changing. In, in Stanford, I've heard that the, those tests are, it's, it's possible that the composers won't have to take them anymore because they're accepting students now that can't read music at the graduate level. And so then it, it really begs the question, well, what, yeah. if, you, if you graduate with a doctorate in music, what does that mean? Well, there is a, there's a, maybe we have to parse that a little bit more. Fea in her introduction said the PhD, but there is, there's so-called Doctor of Musical Arts, which is uh, not an academic degree, but a skill degree. And there's PhD, which is more, uh, supposedly, more intellectual and more abstract and more concerned with, uh, uh, I guess, writing papers and so on. But it's sort of, I mean, they're kind of it's interchangeable, still, like... Yeah, they're... Yeah. It, 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 in general, that's not a very meaningful thing because each institution's history determines what degree it has. It's not a matter of choice. It's a matter of uh, sort of evolutionary reality. So um, you're looking for yourself. You're looking for your voice. You're looking for your resonances. And what kind of thing do you find most useful and what kinds of things were less so? During my education or? Hmm. Well, uh, I mean, let's start with that. But. 
well, like, um, yeah, an environment that really supported experimentation. So having the facilities, having, like, at UC San Diego, um, you could put on concerts with your colleagues any, any night of the week, it seemed. And um, just having access, having other people that you can bounce ideas off of. So, so a larger cohort um, rather than these, some of these other schools where you enter in with one other person. And so it's just a very small group of people that treat their program like it's a residency. Mm-hmm. So community. Okay, so that, that's a, certainly, especially, I think, in music. Having a community is an extremely important thing. Uh, the cohort is a good word for that. And it's difficult if your aim is to become uh, a composer, let's say, or uh, even even in, in terms of improvisation and so on, what do you do if this is an abstraction that is served on the basis of, let's say, once or twice a year, a group coming in for two days or three days and sight reading your music, recording it, and then leaving? Yeah. I know, you, and as a composer, you spend countless hours working on something. Yeah. Only to have one performance, and then it's over. And and one performance that's been prepared, <clears throat> very. I mean, these are very very good musicians. And one of the things uh, that that might not be obvious uh, to a lay person is that music, on a professional level, music is an extremely ergonomic uh, behavior, and it is expected that any professional can do any part immediately. I mean, that level of skill is assumed. So the the idea, at least, that music is is extremely economical. You can do it in a couple of rehearsals, right? Then the question becomes, what is it? What is the it that you have done? Whereas if you're preparing, let's say, a, a theater work, and you're working in the theater context, the expectation is months and months and months of discussion, of trial, of error, of adjustment, of reconsideration, of so on. And that's pretty much not the part, the the path in the the music profession, at least outside of academic context. Yeah, I mean, they work on the assumption that, that, that there's all these idiomatic things that they can just kind of pick up from your music, but every time they meet a new a new composer and a new piece, it's a whole new sound world and language to learn. It's not something that they can just look at and pick up in two rehearsals. Yeah. At least, maybe it's the facsimile or a, a virtual uh, right. realization. But this is, uh, yeah, it, it's a complicated thing. So, so okay, uh, community, facilities, what about instruction per se yeah, that is yeah. sitting there in a in a room with somebody who's looking at what you're writing or listening to what you're saying and responding i know it's really special in the you know in the way that composers learn you know because you have this mentor mentorship you know in, in other disciplines you don't sit in a room with someone and just talk about your ideas um so yeah, I've I've had some very very great teachers that that have always just pushed me towards trying to get to where it is that I want to, and not kind of trying to push their own agenda on me. And I guess that's the most important thing about teaching composition is kind of trying to get that student, like you said, to do what they want to do the best that they can. But how do you, you know? But how do you do that as a yeah, teacher? Yeah, well. It, it's, of course, a very complex subject in our time because there are not the commonalities, the so-called common practice, yeah. which is the, the traditional musical term for a period of time when everybody agrees on the rules, so to speak. The, this is a time when no one agrees on anything. And as a result, it, uh, uh, you know, the, the question is, on the one hand, does this classical idea of models function reasonably anymore, or does it promote rebellion rather than growth? 
And yet, on the other hand, if your effort is to try to customize education to each individual young artist, this is uh, extremely time-consuming, extremely demanding, and, and again, <clears throat> you, you have to wonder about the efficacy of it. You have to wonder, is it good? I don't have an answer to this, incidentally. Yeah. Uh, is it good that we nurture more and more people with independent personal visions that require independent nourishment and independent response from performers. And, and how do you evaluate their, their work or their progress, you know, if it's completely self-determined and it's not maybe your cup of tea? Mm. It's like, how do, we, how do we look at these works? And Have know. you done any teaching yourself of I this sort? Yes, I have. <clears throat> and what's your... What's your guess on that? Well, I try, I try to ask a lot of questions and read their score and try to figure out what it is they're trying to do and if that, from what I can read, if that is lining up with um, their goals in the piece. But if something, if something is really strange, I just, I just kind of I have to say it as a warning. It... Yeah, I had one of my teachers, uh, the composer in residence at the University of Michigan many years ago, was known for his bluntness. I mean, he was just incorrigibly unable to say anything except the truth as he saw it. And this was, of course, devastating to any young musician who didn't happen to already have experienced it. And when sometimes we had a Midwest Composers Symposium where people from the University of Illinois, University of Iowa, University of Chicago, University of Michigan would get together in the spring and, and have all their works performed and so on. It was a wonderful communal thing. And Ross could not go to those things because when he spoke, the students from the other schools were just brought to a point of, you know, the, suicidal yeah. despair. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, you ask, <clears throat> when we were between the sessions, you ask a question which is maybe the, the crucial one and a, extremely difficult to answer, and that is, how do you really tell, how does, how do I, how, how will Mich Michelle, in her own teaching, how do you decide who has merit? How do you decide who should be encouraged and who you should say very gently, maybe flower arranging would be better <laughs> or carpentry or you know, some, something else? Uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is very tricky and it comes into play first in the admissions process. <clears throat> so every program, and, of course, this isn't just peculiar to music. It's in all the arts and in all disciplines. There is an admissions process, and as anyone in this country knows, that is now starting with preschool. Uh, it, it has become uh, so onerous now that, uh, <clears throat> well, my own granddaughter was interviewed for half an hour in... Uh, when she was three years old without her mother present. And afterwards, uh, the interviewer said, you know, you should really think about teaching Lindley uh, her letters and numbers and so on. And, and our daughter said, well, <laughs> of course she knows that. And the person said, well, she didn't say a word the entire half hour. So about uh, two months later, they asked her back and her mother explained to her what the game was. So then every time the interviewer asked her a question, she would go around and whisper the answer into her ear, thereby maintaining her own dignity mm -hmm. and not having to be defamed by this miserable process. So it goes on like that all the way through. So when, when we look at uh, an, an, an applicant to our program, we look for three things. <clears throat> First is... We, we look for music that is, speaks to us as music. Now, you may well ask, what does that mean? But there is a, an astonishing level of consistency, even between musicians with completely different outlooks 
as to whether that's musical. Musical seems to be something about which there is some common understanding. So it has to be musical, and the second thing is they have to write in such a way and about such things as we think are uh, applicable in our program. So their enthusiasms and the way they think comes through in their, much more than the, in their transcripts. In fact, uh, there was, a, we were talking about a person earlier whose transcripts were dismal, but whose academic future now uh, looks very, very bright indeed. There was a germ there, there was something very special there. And the third thing is we, in San Diego especially, look very seriously at the statement of purpose. We want to know who really wants to be in our community because that motivation is crucial to commitment and it's crucial to the cohesiveness of the program. So after admission, then it's a matter of sitting down in a seminar or in your office with a young person and the I guess the thing that I find most revealing is to listen to a recording of a work of theirs hopefully a performance and going through it just one time listening to this work I'll, I'll feel and I, I, I'm sure that you do the same thing you, you feel that there are certain moments, whatever the nature of the piece, there are certain moments where there's something happening. Again, That's surprising, very, yeah. Something happening. And so at the end, after I've heard the piece, if it's in a group context with everybody, or if it's in a single context, then I say, show me where in this work, in the score, things are particularly interesting or problematic for you. And if those two things align, then there's a, there's a path. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. So it's, it's looking for things that they may recognize, but only subliminally, as it were, not really you know, being fully conscious of. And I think that's one of the responsibilities that we have not only as teachers, but to our profession, is to help it be filled with people who are better people. Better people, yeah. More, more motivated, more capable, and more willing to listen to others instead of themselves. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to listen generously, even if it's sort of not your aesthetic but to just to listen to, to someone else's work and, and try to see what they're trying to do. And that's my practice. In our, in our compositional seminars, that is the goal, that everyone in the seminar understands what everyone else is trying to do, how they're trying to do it, and then, of course, when it's publicly performed, everyone knows whether it happened or it didn't happen. And everyone shares in the, the positive side and everyone has a stake in, in something that didn't turn out well and, and grows, hopefully, from that. So you guys have listened to us uh, for a while. Do you have any questions? Yes. So repeat the question. Or? Oh, that that there are people that can enter into a university without reading music, and um, yeah. And they decide to become composer. Yeah, because there are ways. There are other ways of composing. Um, like I think it it is possible to to create your own notation. And well, most of all. <clears throat> the changes in technology and the growing experience and the growing uh, openness 
of musicians at different levels and with different stylistic persuasions to work with each other and to uh, elicit through rehearsal and improvisational activities and so on the kernel of what someone is interested in. Now, I think both those things have increased a little. I, mean, um, I, I wonder in 20 years what a music department's going to look like. If it's really going to shift over to, um, you know, getting rid of all of these, like, these kind of old-fashioned ideas, I don't know, of, of demanding that each student must be able to, to analyze a piece of music... You well, know, like from, you know, the 18th, 18th century and um, be able to show that they can play the piano. Or I'm thinking that that's going to go away. Well, it's, it's certainly happening in all fields that the goalposts are shifting. And I think the important thing, from my point of view, uh, as I look at this, the important thing is not that these standards or these expectations go away entirely, but rather that they move to other terrain. So that instead of being asked to do A, B, C, D, E, you are rather expected to do L, M, N, O, P or something like that. So that it's not a matter of saying we don't expect anything of you, but we're open to the idea that what you have comes to us in an unfamiliar package or uh, in, in a form that we are not immediately clear on, you know, as a way, as a path, that it has to be explored, it has to be learned. Uh, yeah, because without the commonalities, it's very hard to have a community. So, I mean, it, it's a complex time. I, I gave a lecture some years ago to, uh, on a faculty luncheon series in which I called Living in a Bridge. And the idea of it was that we're building out, but there's no clear place that that bridge is going to go to. And it may be that we are living forever now in a vessel <laughs> that's moving outward somewhere. And so being adaptable becomes extremely important. And opening to other ways is imperative. I, I, as a layman, if you don't, if you compose something and you, how you don't write it down in the traditional form of notes or whatever you said, how can you get other people to know what you Composed, do you do it by sound, or I mean, how can you remember? How do you get it repeated a second time? How do ideas travel? Right? Yeah, like if you're not using traditional notation, you can. It can be text-based. Um, it can be a in, in completely invented notation with a key that describes what those symbols mean. Also, you're inventing a new language in order to explain. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes, you know, it's not so important to repeat the same, the performance exactly twice. And so it's, it's just, you know, it's working with musicians and, and creating some kind of idea together. Um, or, com or composing on the computer and, and just shaping sound that way. Yeah, this, uh, this is a, a reality now which surely was not the case uh, 10 or 15 years ago that software packages are so powerful and so flexible. In fact, uh, it, it's not only in music that th this is happening, but there was a, an extraordinary show at the San Francisco, uh, at a San Francisco museum, it's not the, the Museum of Contemporary Art, of uh, David Hockney's work uh, last winter. And one of the, uh, there was a, a, a space about like the entire wall here made up of panels roughly of that same size that were projecting versions of an iPad screen and they were showing things that Hockney had done with his finger on the screen 
And occasionally, instead of just being images, there would be a screen which would show you the whole drawing process from the first mark he made, when he erased, when he did more shading and so It's just fantastic. And I thought, you know, what an educational tool. Uh, they didn't sell it. It wasn't, uh, you know, you couldn't take it away. I secretly, uh, you know, hiding in my coat, I've <laughs> filmed one of them. Uh, and it's, it's a, a wonderful thing. But the point is technology is opening all kinds of doors uh, in relation to sharing. Hmm? Yeah, it's great. You don't have to depend on other institutions or whatever, you know, to disseminate your music. You can just put it online. Yeah. I had the pleasure of seeing your perf- the concert last evening, mm-hmm. and uh, it was wonderful. It was very creative. I want to ask Dr. Bloom on her piece, Porcupine, how long did, you, did it take you to create? So it, it's, it's a little embarrassing. I only spent a month composing that piece. Normally I prefer to, take, to spend about six to nine months on a piece. But it, I was in the process of defending my degree and um, I had all these other things going on. And then I had this deadline for this piece and I, just, I had to just kind of wait until I graduated and until I could work on it. And then I just worked on it um, probably like 12 hours a day for a month. Oh, thanks. Well, that was definitely not done. In a, <laughs> I, back to the but back to that subject, the the subject of uh, intensity and focus. That was one of uh, Schoenberg's uh, criteria. Was what he called heat. And a number of his most important works were written in about a week and a half. Oh, the, really? the String Trio, uh, Erwartung, and a couple of others that were major works of his that he did in 18 days. So it's, it's, it's not a, like a steeplechase, it's, but... But it's a little, you know, it's a little scary because you want to be able to, to write something and then have a little distance from it yeah. and then go back to it. But in... in In a short amount of time, you just have to go for it, and you can't go back. That's one of the things that tends to be a cold bath once you leave your studies. You get out into the world, and then you find that opportunity is linked to demand. Yeah. I mean, I I often ask myself if, if people stopped asking me for music, would I stop composing? Because it's like it motivates you, but... um, it's become that way, unfortunately. You, we mm-hmm. can't just kind of compose an orchestra piece with no, with no promised concert, because it just it doesn't make sense. I don't know. So you had a promised concert with the Jack Quartet? Yeah. Okay. There's one more, maybe one more. <laughs> so to try to inject a little reality So uh, I'm not sure internships is the, uh, is, you mean in relation to learning to be a composer? In, to see what's out there as a job possibility for composers. Yeah, I mean, traditionally the path for composers has always been to become a professor. Hmm. And the, to, to teach. What about it? Oh, sorry. I mean, the, but there, I don't know what other possibilities there are oh. to other than teaching well certainly at this point i mean i, I guess firstly to to quickly address the question of of internships or or ways of <clears throat> a music student working in the profession uh, it's not common uh, as it is now in almost every other field <clears throat> and i don't know i guess perhaps it's not clear to me exactly why <clears throat> excuse me, why that would be that way. But the the uh, thing that I've been noticing over the last, I'd say, 10 years is that the percentage of people graduating from my program and certainly at other places like Harvard and, and uh, uh, Stanford and Columbia uh, is that 
fewer students are going into academic life and more of them are finding a freelance existence in one way or another. Yeah, and it's really scary. Yeah, yeah of yeah. course it's scary. But, you know, I think that's increasingly, I mean, if you look at academic life and you realize that, that uh, the downturn in 2008 caused so many institutions to economically contract, and now very, very many programs decide that if a senior person uh, retires or leaves, they're not replaced. Yeah, I mean, if, every year there's maybe about four or five posi- open positions around the nation, and there's <laughs> hundreds, if not thousands, of us yep. looking for a job. It's a very rough situation. Hmm? Instruments, musical instruments, are going to become irrelevant if you use only computers to compose. I, I personally don't see that <clears throat> any of any of that uh, the history going away. I see it as being increasingly embra- uh, the circle getting larger. Mm-hmm, I agree. Like you demonstrated yesterday. Excuse me. Like you and your quartet and the com- composers. Well, I, yesterday in yeah. the live performance. Certainly, one of the things that I'm doing is to try increasingly to exercise my capacities in spaces other than concert halls. And with technology well, Technology allows this, and especially great public spaces uh, provide a kind of gravitas or occasion, you know, uh, that, that people, uh, they're willing to enter in and uh, experience it. I think we've done it. This has been the National Gallery of Art podcast. 